management of, of uh, uh, agriculture water management in the Nile Delta, which is going to become uh, even more crucial as things like the Grand Renaissance Dam upstream built for energy production in Ethiopia will also affect the water availability in the Nile Delta. Um, th this is actually a case study from India that I just wanted to stress. To, th this is where, again, groundwater is being overpumped. There was policies to try and get farmers to pump more groundwater to improve food security in India. This was very successful through the 70s and 80s and did really well. The issue then became with all those subsidies, it was very difficult politically to stop giving those subsidies. So stopping pumping and, and, and stop the degradation of the groundwater proved very difficult. The solution uh, Gujarat came up with, the state in India, was to basically separate the, the energy line. So controlling water management by changing how you manage electricity and providing separate lines for the, the irrigation wells. The farmers got their electricity on a rotation, but they got a much better supply, uh, a more stable supply, and, and uh, the electricity companies became sustainable. They could actually function. So the energy water sectors both benefited from this. Agricultural productivity has been grown in Gujarat, and, and uh, the only state in, in Western India where groundwater levels are improving. And just a, a quick mention also around institutions in terms of water markets. One thing we've been working with on partners is to look not so much at large-scale water market ideas, but to look at some of the indigenous market systems, even in the US, in places like in, in Oman, how these work, how we can scale those up, where they actually work in a local context, because actually most of the successful markets tend to be at a, a relatively low scale in, in the local communities and systems. Just a quick mention of some of the partnerships that Dr. Hassan was mentioning. We are part of the, the Middle East and North Africa network of water centers, the Center of Excellence. Um, one of the areas that I, I did, haven't spoken too much about water quality, but there's are certainly areas where we have issues in, in Nebraska. We have issues elsewhere, but this is an emerging problem. And we have a joint program with the Royal Scientific Society here on occurrence of the fate of pharmaceuticals in the water food linkages. And these are important considerations where there's very close connections between the, the water and the, and the food systems. And also supporting managed aquifer recharge, where we see opportunities actually to take some of these ideas back to Nebraska, where it's now being explored as ideas in certain sub-basins where we have issues around recharge. If you need more information on the Water for Food Institute, there's plenty of linkages through various social media, and if you really would like to explore this further, we have a conference next month on many of these topics and others in Nebraska, so please do, do participate. I had some concluding comments. I think the challenges and the potential solutions, actually there's lots of solutions. Jordan and other countries in this region have tested many ideas. There's good ideas that could be transferred back to the US. We've got some things we've actually are, are adopting from this part of the world, and vice versa. Sustainability is a process, and I think, if anything, coming back into Jordan, where we've gone from 160 cubic meters per capita per day down to 90 cubic meters per capita per day, it's certainly a, 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 a challenging process. The contexts vary. Even across this region, they really vary. And the, we must keep in mind these regional and global challenges, because even if we get water management in the Nile Basin correct, we have issues further up the basin that could create problems for us. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, good discussion, good points for discussion later on. Water Productivity Act. What does it mean? How it gets implemented? Probably, you know, we can talk about it. And some of the things related to water market, creating water market. These are very good points. Please help me welcome Yes. Yes. Yeah, we'll we'll allow for more time for discussion and probably this time for for the speakers now. But later, you know, we can have some discussion. That's a suggestion from Dr. Hazem.
As, as I said, you know, I'd like to welcome Nancy Islick from USAID to deliver her speech. Your Excellency, Dr. Hazem Al Nasser, Minister of Water and Irrigation, Dr. McCormick, Dr. Al Shawa, and distinguished guests. It gives me great pleasure to be here this morning to discuss our continued support of the Jordan water sector and our partnership with the government of Jordan. USAID has partnered with Jordan for over 60 years, specifically in the water sector. As you know too well, the water situation in Jordan is dire, as is the case for many parts of the Arab region. Water resources are limited, populations are increasing, and there is conflict and turmoil in the surrounding region. Reflecting here in Jordan, USAID has helped the government to plan and respond to its growing water needs. In the early 1950s, USAID helped Jordan with its very first master plan for water resource development in the Jordan River Basin. Together, we built the King Abdullah Canal in 1969. In the 1980s, we improved and constructed wastewater facilities in Amman, Aqaba, Urbid, and Zarqa. Since the 2000s, we've provided over a billion dollars to strengthen the water sector. Investments have included construction of the Asamra wastewater treatment plant and the Zaramayin water treatment facility, community-based projects in each of the 12 governorates, the establishment of the Aqaba Water Company, and work with rehabilitating infrastructure in the north, which has been particularly hard hit through the influx of Syrian refugees. In the coming five years, USAID will continue this partnership and invest another $250 million in Jordan's water sector, promoting conservation and efficient measures, as well as infrastructure. We are deploying state-of-the-art conservation technologies and investing in hydroponics and water-efficient systems. We're promoting greater water awareness involvement. This includes demonstrating water conservation and, most importantly, reclaimed water programs, as well as cultivating community-based alliances for the stewardship of shared water resources. S despite the efforts of governments and donors throughout the Middle East and North Africa, the region remains the most water-stressed and least secure water region in the world. With the influx of refugees, Jordan is in even greater need of water conservation and development of new water resources. Many countries within the Arab region face this similar situation. This kind of extreme water shortage is vicious and unrelenting. It discourages job-creating investments in the, indus in the industrial sector. It causes health and sanitation concerns. And if people open their taps and don't see water coming out as a potential source of instability. It's for this reason USAID continues to work diligently with the Ministry of Water and Irrigation to improve wastewater and water infrastructure, strengthen water management and governance, and increase water conservation. If you indulge me, I have to mention a little bit about one innovative project that's been discussed this morning. USAID and myself are incredibly proud of the progress of working with His Excellency Dr. Hazem Al Nasser and the government of Jordan and the regional governments, donors on the Red Sea to Dead Sea project. Together, we've brought this project from a concept to reality, including providing $100 million of a contribution from the United States government. We're pleased with the progress we've seen so far, and we look forward to our continued support and the support of the region for this program. USAID. And, our strong, and the strong partnership with the government of Jordan and the government of, and the people of Jordan.
for the past six decades, we've worked side by side as Jordan establishes itself as a leader in the water sector, promoting progress, innovation, and conservation. Events like this one today leave me optimistic that for the next 60 years, we'll work together in the water sector and increase both the supply and the availability of funds to make this region more stable. It's exciting to see the challenges and the opportunities that we face together. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for this elaborate talk on USAID programs and what USAID has been supporting to increase the resilience of the water sector, water and sanitation sectors in Jordan. Now I'd like to move on and invite Dr. Rashad Shoa to talk to us about the global initiative that was launched recently in Paris, January 25th. The International Water Bank tell us about its objectives, where it's going, and what you want to achieve out of this conference. Thank you. Your Excellency, Mr. Hazem Nasser, distinguished guests, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, I want to thank Mr. Khaldun, you know, for his uh, excellent uh, work and dedication towards, you know, the achieving this conference. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the water situation uh, in the world, uh, we all know about it. Uh, in my own belief, it's there is a plenty of water around the world, but there is a problem in the water resource management uh, that we have on a global level. And uh, the true cooperations between countries and, of course, the lack of finance uh, to uh, back up uh, these uh, projects into the development of the water sector globally. Uh, what I would like to talk about is uh, at this moment we are here, there is billions of gallons of water running off from rivers into oceans uh, that uh, the project of my resources international, which is uh, the only company in the world uh, going into water concession management and water rights and owning of these water resources and transporting it via mega VLCC tankers. Today we transport oil and gas in tankers. We, uh, uh, world economies depend on it. At the end of the day, why not water? And countries within European community has been saved by transporting water to them from Greece to Cyprus or from Marseille to Barcelona. And at the end of the day, um, we uh, are actually backing up this and encouraging it to happen, especially with the main focus that could be the target in the Arab countries and mainly the GCC Council. Uh, the Gulf countries uh, actually depend of, uh, uh, on desalination as the only source of water. And there is major hazards and uh, challenges into this industry, as His Excellency mentioned. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the salinity level in the, in, in the Gulf reached to be uh, 56,000 ppm which is in normal cases in, in oceans and seas between 28,000 to 34,000 ppm. And if it reaches be beyond the 80,000 level, we're going to have a shutdown of the desalination plants. I addressed the subject to the ministers in the GCC, and I said to them, what is your contingency plan if these desalination plants stopped working for the reasons which I have mentioned to them, and the last of them was the Bushehr nuclear reactor in Iran, which if any blow up or damage to this reactor, and it's the only reactor in the world that have the intake and discharge of water from the Arabian Gulf, they will be forced to shut down and then they will face 
a really catastrophe. The answer from the ministers were zero. No plan whatsoever. They have reservoirs. Kuwait, where I come from, is actually uh, the uh, um, country that has a nine days reserves in case of any shot on the daily consumption rate. There is a serious problem that will happen to the other countries in, in, in the GCC Council. Of course, we know Jordan is under a lot of stress of water and the transportation of water could really back up. It will not be to ask the countries in the GCC to eliminate and stop desalination, but rather than to have a backup strategy uh, uh, for the water supply in, in them. Coming out of this, I raised the subject to the IFC and the World Bank, and uh, they were absolutely very cooperative on, on this issue. So, uh, and they liked the idea that if we look around us, there is no water bank it is specializing into the finance and backing up and incubating uh, projects all around the world with main focus into the Middle East and uh, on the other parts of the world. So uh, uh, the idea was adapted and was very much welcomed. And we have established uh, uh, now the initiative which we took place in Paris, France on the 25th of January, which con uh, chaired by Dr. Mirza Hassan, the Dean of the Executive Board at the World Bank. Uh, with world personalities uh, being involved into uh, this board to gear up all uh, and focus and supervise all the gearing up stage which we expect to be within the course of the next few months to be fully incorporated in order to prevent, you know, to offer finance to uh, the water sector industry. We know very well that there is always lack of finance which deprive projects to be completed or actually to be delayed. So even though on the international banking level, in their portfolios, there is a small significant amount which is dedicated towards the water into their overall portfolio, which will be uh, uh, offered to finance this sector. Of course, at the end of the day, we look at backing up all the water projects globally. Uh, the finance of the bank, and which will be determined very soon, to be a capital of three to five billion dollar as a start. And this is something very, very achievable. Uh,